when the events of this film transpired, Jason, you were 11 years old living in Canada. So <laughs> this, is, I mean, this is kind of like making a film about Abraham Lincoln for you in terms of <laughs> distance in your life. So, so what got your attention about this? How did this come to you? I, I, I should say at that point, I, I was living in Los Angeles and had a green card. But, okay. Uh, uh, but was the child of Canadians. <laughs> um, this story, my, my journey really started three years ago when I heard a Radiolab piece on Matt Bai's book on Gary Hart. And I frankly, I just couldn't believe that there was a moment in our recent history that the presumed next president of the United States wound up in an alleyway in the middle of the night with a group of journalists and nobody knew what to do because no one had ever been in their shoes before. And the more I thought about the story and the, uh, the more I talked to friends about it, uh, the more it just, it seemed as though it had all this connective tissue with everything we're talking about today, uh, whether it's gender politics or the line between a public life and a private life or uh, the relationship between candidates and, and journalists. It seemed to touch on all of these ideas that we are all trying to figure out. And, and look, I, I make movies because I have questions. I'm like anyone else here. I'm trying to wonder, how the hell did we get here? And... Uh, and I thought this seemed like an interesting thread to pull on. And so you called Matt? I, I reached out to uh, Matt, and Matt and Jay were already working together on this. And this, look, this is an unusual screenplay in that it was co-written by Matt Bai, uh, who uh, is a New York Times Magazine journalist, uh, covered five different presidential elections. Jay Carson, who political operative, was the press secretary for Hillary Clinton in 08, and Howard Dean and Tom Daschle. Worked with Senators Bradley, Schumer, Tom Daschle. Yeah, uh, and, and of course me, the son of the director of Ghostbusters. So <laughs> I think but of course. we all had valuable experience that <laughs> made sense uh, for this film. Uh, but look, uh, this is we decided early on that while this is a movie that centers around one person, it has 20 main characters. We wanted it to be as much from the point of view of the people on the campaign, the point of view of his family, the point of view of the various journalists, and it was written on the shoulders of their experience. To start with what is essentially a tale of a fulcrum moment in American politics and to get it to the screen, there are great, great political stories out there, but not all of them get told in this fashion. No, I think very few get told in this in this fashion. I mean, um, I, I think what was uh, it's it's obviously you know the 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 it was based on the book, but the book is very sprawling, and, and as you know, we've talked about it. It's you know, it covers a lot of territory before and after the scandal. Uh, I think to adapt this, you needed we needed sort of a unity of creative vision, and I think you know the the, the first time we all sat down, Jason and Jay and I. Um, we we all wanted to tell the same story, which is not just a true story, but uh, a story that was that showed the complexity of all the people involved. Uh, no heroes and villains, you know, as just Jay always says. But but to have it be um, to to give everybody their perspective, to to make a movie that wasn't going to hit people over the head and tell them what to think. That was that was a, you know a, a big challenge, and we all wanted it to feel super real. Uh, and like you've been dropped into a world and hopefully you feel that way where, you know, sometimes you have to catch up. Frankly, sometimes it might be a little confusing, mm -hmm. but, but where, you know, you have the sense that you're really dropped into something and, it, and that, that feels very authentic. I think that the fact that we were all on the same creative page m made adapting this not only very doable, but, you know, super fun. Yeah, but between the two of us, you know, Matt and I have done eight presidential campaigns, um, and we're often turned off by, you know, a lot of what we, the portrayals of that world that we'd seen before, um, because you end up with one-dimensional archetypal characters, good guys and bad guys, black hats and white hats, heroes and villains, and in all of our time in, in Washington, which is a lot, um, you know, we never met any through and through heroes. We never met any through and eh, maybe met a through a few through <laughs> a, a few through and through villains. But um, no, it was important. It was important for us in this not to, uh, as Matt said, not to have it be a message movie, but to have it feel like the world that we spent so much time in. And that world is a world populated by human beings, whether they're journalists or candidates or or voters or spouses or staffers. They're all human beings, and I think humans make the three-dimensional humans make the best characters. 
Um, they're all human beings who are in difficult spots, usually under a lot of pressure, facing something that they don't know how to do, and they're trying to do their best at it. In this case, Matt had stumbled up, uh, upon this period where mm -hmm. people were facing something for the very first time. N this had never happened before to any of them, so we watched these human beings struggle in that, and, and it was great to have Jason pushing us to go even further and deeper into reality. Um, and, you know, it was just, it was a really inspiring, uh, really a joyous experience from the very, very first time we sat down and started breaking story. Helen, as one of the producers with Jason and a couple of other folks, was this a hard sell? Was it, oh God, another politics movie? Was it, that was 30 years ago? Or was it a natural? Um, well, we were very lucky. We did, Jason and I did tell this movie Tully uh, with Aaron Gilbert. And um, that sort of partnership of the three of us for that movie, and I mean, there were more producers on that one too, but the, for the, it became a sort of way, we had such an easy way to talk about it creatively and talk about the ideas. And so we were given a lot of support because it was, you know, I think this amazing script that they wrote and obviously Hugh's involvement. And uh, yeah, I, it was, it's funny, I think on the surface it looks sort of, when you sort of the elevator pitch seems a bit difficult, but we felt like it was, we were very supported throughout and um, yeah. Eric, obviously this is a, a film about a specific period, not just an era, but a few months in a, a specific year. And you evoked it with some of the, the hardware of the moment, like a phone booth, which you can tell your children is a small, very tiny room with a phone in it that you pick up and make calls from. Um, and, and yet it wasn't over the top. It wasn't so detailed. How did you find that place where you were suggestive of the look of the period without making it sort of anal compulsive, like everything has to be exactly correct down to the menus? I think we came from a place of simplicity. Uh, Jason and I referenced a lot of movies that were shot in the 70s, funny enough, even though we're doing a movie in the 80s, um, because there was uh, a simplicity to the filmmaking, uh, a lot of long shots, um, uh, kind of a lo-fi, uh, low-tech approach. So we sourced a lot of equipment, uh, lights, lenses, and we kind of let that dictate how we were going to move forward and where we were going to our, point our camera, how long we were going to let shots run, how we were going to block scenes. And it created a new way of... Uh, working for us that we hadn't done, which was really exciting because we were bouncing between all these points of view in the story and plot lines and places. And we shot on film again. And we shot on film. It was Did our you? first yeah. film on film since, uh, first film on film, uh, since Up in the Air. And this, there's that magical thing that happened that uh, I had kind of forgotten because we had made so many movies digitally since Up in the Air that when you actually roll, the whole set knows. When you, when you turn on the digital camera, I, I find people don't know. You, you hit the button and, and nothing really has changed. But when you actually roll film and it's like you lit a fuse uh, and you can hear it, there's that electricity to it. And I, I didn't realize how much I missed that. And the look of it, too, has it's like the difference between vinyl and digital music, I think. Yeah, well, look, uh, we made an early decision, and this started in the writing, and it continued through the acting, and then the cinematography, uh, which was, look, the, philos the philosophy of the film is what is important. Right, this is the question that we're all asking today. It's the, f the question the film is asking: What is relevant versus what is entertaining? Uh, these days, you you know, you wake up in the morning, you open your phone, you look at the news app, and there's a uh, there's a story about the midterms, and right next to it is a story about the breakup of Ariana Grande and uh, 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 Pete Davidson, and and they're both put out by the Washington Post, and they're both given equal weight, and it's very hard to tell which one of these is the real story, which one is politics, and which one is entertainment. And so if we're going to be asking this question philosophically of the audience, what we all began to discuss was, OK, how can we ask this question cinematically? And it starts with that opening shot, where we're presenting 10 different conversations that are all overlapped from actors you don't know at first of which, who is important, who is unimportant. We're introducing you know, the history of the character, which is playing on a TV. We're introducing the technology of the era, the fact that the satellite truck had just changed uh, and, t and created the 24-hour news cycle, and we're and our sound mixer it, it was uh, miking every actor on set at all times and live mixing all their dialogue, which was which was partly improvised. So uh, the idea, yes, indeed, <laughs> um, he played his mixer like a piano, and a lot of what you heard today was the production mix of the dialogue. 
so I think we were all playing with this idea of how do we ask this question at all times through all departments of, you know, what is important, all the way down to the last shot of the film where there's a television on one side of the screen and there is a marriage on the other. And on the television is this speech, the, the, the most important speech Gary Hart probably ever made. It was his final speech as a politician. And on the other side is a marriage holding on for dear life. And we're asking you, all the way to the last moments, what do you actually want to look at? Hugh, when you portray a real person, you want to convey rather than imitate, I would think. So how did you build Gary Hart's character? Uh, well, this is the second time I played a real character. Wolverine was the first. And <laughs> <laughs> I tried to find him. He's impossible to find. <laughs> so he didn't review your performance? Like <laughs> oh, no. I've, I've had... I, I mean, there's been several incidents in my houses, I presume, are him, you know. Or raccoons. Yeah, or raccoons. <laughs> um, no, I was nervous about it, obviously hoping, uh, presuming that he would see the movie. And so in preparation, uh, obviously I have an amazing resource because these guys, a bit Matt knew him very well and spent a lot of time with him in writing the book. And I spent time with his campaign team and uh, I had incredible help from a woman called Amy Stevens who's an incredible dramaturg and researcher who helped me put together f um, like scripted from books and interviews but also video footage over 60 hours of video footage but it, it was never our goal or to actually physically imitate Gary there was I listened a lot to his speeches because he had a particular way of speaking publicly and privately it was very brief it was to the point it was simple it was clear and in press conferences, I thought, really unusual for a politician. I mean, I'd drag on and on and on. He would be very clear and very quick. And so I wanted to get that. So I would listen to his voice to get clues. But it's more about getting the essence of someone um, rather than doing, a, for me, th than doing a really perfect, clear imitation. We did the wig. We had that discussion. Yeah. Should we do the hair or not? You kind of have to with you that. you got to. Everyone yeah. talks about Gary Hart's hair, so we had to do something with that. W was it your hair or a wig? It was a wig. I couldn't pull off the hair. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Please thank the panel.